Thanks, uh, thank you, Mike, for that. The last time I saw Mike was a few months ago in Australia at the Third International Conference on Men's Issues. And he asked if he could, uh, if he could interview me, along with, you know, he was interviewing a number of speakers, and very rashly I agreed. Um, so the first question, I'll take it to my grave. He asked, well, you know, when, when, when the film was rolling, um, he, said, he said, Mike, on a, on a scale of one to ten, how much do you hate women? <laughs> Nine or ten? <laughs> and it went downhill from there, I'll tell you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Um, for the past couple of years, our number one campaign has been to end the non-therapeutic circumcision of male minors in the UK, or male genital mutilation, MGM. And I've handed out some leaflets today that we were handing out uh, outside the Tory party conference about three weeks ago. Um, we refer to it as male genital mutilation, deliberately to, to draw a parallel with female genital mutilation, FGM. Now, some people get upset by our drawing that parallel. But the truth is that all MGM is more injurious than most, M, most FGM. And I've had, I've had people, men and women, at conferences and at protests walk away. In, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, that is just simply a biological fact. But to me, it's an interesting in indicator of the empathy gender gap that people would, would refuse to think that's even possible. Now, almost all Jewish, so I was going to say Jewish boys, but in line with, um, with um, oh, who's the guy? Richard, the, the God Delusion. Um, Dawkins. Dawkins. He, yes, I, I read this last night and I thought, I've, I've actually put the, put the expression Jewish babies. And, and so I shall say, almost all Jewish babies, uh, uh, oh, I've done it again, almost all babies born to Jewish parents are circumcised at eight days old, while boys born to Muslim parents tend to be circumcised at a later age, but significantly always before puberty. So they don't get to realize how much less pleasure they will enjoy during sex, following the, following the loss of the Rich, the nerve-rich foreskin. It's estimated that around 90%, 9-0, of the nerve endings which give men pleasure during sex are to be found in the foreskin. Now, we, we, we've been pursuing a number of approaches to ending MGM, including street protesting, um, but I'll focus on legal approaches in this talk. Some people remain doubtful about the claim that we make all the time that MGM is illegal, and often because they mistakenly consider that the Crown's refusal to bring prosecutions is evidence of, of legality. Well, the Crown doesn't bring prosecutions for the crime of paternity fraud either, never has. And MGM is just one of many areas where males are treated absolutely appallingly by the criminal justice system in comparison with females. Male minors in the UK have fewer rights to bodily integrity than dogs. The penalties for illegal docking of dogs' tails include a maximum of two years imprisonment and an unlimited fine. Conversely, if you wanted to set yourself up as a circumciser of male minors today, you could, nothing's stopping you. You wouldn't need to undergo any training, and you could carry out the procedures in the most unsanitary conditions, because no checks on your premises will be made. You won't even need to be registered. And if the male minor dies as a result of your work, even if you're prosecuted, the charge will be manslaughter. And if you're found guilty, you'll receive a suspended sentence. Such is the value placed on male lives uh, um, by, by, the, by, by the British state. Um, the claim that MGM is illegal has been made over many years by legal experts, and in 2013, at a conference on genital autonomy, a British human rights lawyer explained that MGM is a crime under the Offences Against the Person Act, being at least actual bodily harm, and almost certainly grievous bodily harm, for which the maximum penalty is life imprisonment. It would require a parliamentary override to be legal, and that has never existed. There are no exemptions to the law uh, for religious or cultural considerations, so all the people who carry out MGM in the UK are criminals. Some of them, we calculate, earn upwards of four or five million pounds over their careers. careers. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so it's our conviction that at the moment the most promising line of attack is a legal one, and I'd like to take you quickly through three potential legal actions in the UK today. The most important one, and the only one of the three which has made it into the mainstream media, re uh, relates to Dr. B Balvinder Mihat, a Nottingham-based doctor who we believe to be Sikh. Five years ago, a young woman in Nottingham who had a, who'd had a relationship with a Muslim man and became pregnant um, the, the relationship broke up before the boy was born, and the mother had sole parental responsibility for the boy from the outset. 
When, uh, um, when he was three months old in 2013, he spent a weekend, I think over Eid, um, with his father and paternal grandmother. When he was returned to his mother, he was in some distress. The mother opened his nappy and, and was horrified to find it soaked with blood, following a circumcision carried out earlier that day by Dr. Mehat, who had not obtained her permission. The boy had been taken by, for, for the procedure by, by, the, you know, by his father and paternal grandmother, and he has suffered medical problems as a result of that circumcision to this day, and he's now four. I'd like to ask Tim Alford to stand up briefly at this point. Tim. Tim, Tim is a Nottingham-based campaigner against MGM, and he's done an absolutely amazing job supporting the mother in her battle to have Dr. Mehat and her son's father and grandmother prosecuted. Tim, thank you. I think I've... <laughs> Frankly, I, I doubt that the mother could have endured the stress, the incredible stress over the last four years without Tim's support. I was with Tim and the mother a year or two ago when the police visited the mother at, at, at her home. The behaviour of the police um, was shocking, to put it mildly. One policewoman telling the mother that her own husband was circumcised and she preferred it that way. Long story short, the police and the CPS refused to press charges. And that's where the matter remained until Simo Chahal, a female human rights lawyer, took an interest in the case. And to our utter amazement, with the benefit of hindsight, she, 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 she successfully managed to get to secure legal aid for, for the mother to, 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 to pursue a case. We were just astonished. So in May of this year, uh, Simo wrote to the police demanding that they review their decision not to prosecute. Uh, and in June, um, the police arrested Dr. Mehat on suspicion of inflicting grievous bodily harm with intent, which you may recall as a uh, maximum sentence of life imprisonment, and also arrested the boy's father and grandmother on suspicions of conspiracy. Two or three weeks ago, the same policewoman who told the boy's mother that she was pleased her husband was circumcised broke the news to, broke the news to the mother that charges would not be brought. She became uh, very upset. I'll now read out um, an extract from a piece on the BBC website following the decision not to press charges. Simo Chahal is, is appealing the Crown Prosecution Service decision and has written a 24-page letter outlining numerous defects in the decision-making process and evaluation of this case. She told the BBC, the decision lacks any semblance of a considered and, re and reasoned decision and is flawed and irrational. If prosecutors do not review their decision within 14 days, she said, the mother will be obliged to take the matter before the administrative court for a determination of these very important issues which need to be resolved not only for her personal case, but also for the wider public interest issues that the case raises. And that's the end of the BBC extract. We're currently about halfway through that 14-day period, so hopefully there'll be some, some news soon. I turn to the other two uh, potential legal cases relating to MGM, in which I'm personally involved. And I'd like here to recognise our lawyer, Ian Tyes, who's been crucial in, de in developing the defence. He can't be here tonight, unfortunately, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send him a copy of this, uh, of this footage. Um, on the drive down to a protest in Parliament last year, I called Ian to say I was thinking of, obstruct, of, of obstructing the traffic in the square as a protest against the inaction of the CPS and the police to bring prosecutions for MGM. He recommended I didn't do it, so naturally I ignored his advice. <laughs> and uh, I, I was... <laughs> so... Um, so I was duly arrested after I was about to stand in front of passing vehicles on the four-lane highway for a second time. That's quite invigorating, I can tell you. Um, so, um, and uh, my thanks to Ewan and Mike, who are with, with, with us today, for, for, for filming that. And there is the, the video is on our YouTube channel. Um, so a week or two later, I was informed that a charge of obstructing the highway would be made, and duly appeared at Hammersmith, Hammersmith Magistrates Court. And my, my defence was a very strong one. The CPS lawyer was utterly hopeless, so naturally I was found guilty. <laughs> the law is truly an ass. I appealed to Isleworth Crown Court, presented the same strong defence, in fact a strengthened, uh, an even stronger one. The second CPS lawyer was even more incompetent than the first, so again I was found guilty. <laughs> or, or my appeal was dismissed, I should say. So I applied to him to have a new appeal at the High Court in the Strand, where we were today, 
where three judges would uh, hear the case. And we think that's, that's our best chance there, three, three judges. Now, the judge agreed in a letter written in March, eight months ago, to grant my appeal to the High Court. And two days after, after he wrote that, the CPS sent a letter, which I got a copy of, informing me that they had requested that the court deny me the chance to appeal to the High Court on the grounds that my application was, in their words, frivolous and groundless. <coughs> I've heard nothing more from any courts or the CPS sins, despite sending them reminders, you know, the wheels of justice turn unbelievably slowly. The final case concerns a Dr. Joseph Spitzer, a Jewish moil or ritual circumciser who claims proudly to have carried out thousands of circumcisions. He heads the British organisation, the Initiation Society, and his clinic is based in Stamford, Stamford Hill, an area with the country's largest population of Orthodox Jews. With Ian's help again, I prepared and presented papers for a private prosecution against Dr. Spitzer at Highbury Magistrates Court. And after a lengthy delay, the, the judge responded, saying we needed to have evidence of procedures Spitzer had performed on named individuals, where and roughly when. Now, that's proving problematical, as you might expect. And the Jewish Chronicle refused my optimistic request to take out a full-page advert asking people to come forward. <laughs> so I may have to resort to door-to-door -door leafleting in the Stamford Hill area. And if anybody would care to join me for that, that, that would be fantastic. I turn now, um, uh, uh, I'm almost done, I turn now to the issue of human rights and ethics. MGM breaches UN and EU Human Rights Acts, including the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And a couple of years ago, I wrote to Anne Longfield, OBE, Child's Commissioner for England, pointing out that a claim on the home page of her website was a blatant lie that children in, uh, in England enjoy all the rights in that UN Convention. She refused to remove the claim from the website, and in response to my freedom of, inf of, freedom of information request related to MGM, her response showed a, a historical complete lack of interest in the subject in the, in the organisation she leads, and still leads. And on, uh, on the subject of ethics, possibly the most insightful writer on, on, on the issues of the ethics of both M MGM and FGM is the ethicist Brian Earp at Oxford University, and he's explained at length why both forms of gentle mutilation are equally unethical. Well, that's, that, that's all I have to say on MGM today, but I'd like to end by saying that I'm hoping to announce next week that the fourth international conference on men's issues We'll definitely be going ahead in London next, uh, next July 20th to 20th. Um, that's the weekend after, after the World Cup ends, so hopefully we'll still be jubilant after England's unexpected win over Germany in the final. <laughs> Thank you.